Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Kiefer, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you on behalf of the Church in the 21st Century Center. So I thought we'd begin um, by offering gratitude. Um, gratitude for our BC community and gratitude for our friends and family and, of course, gratitude uh, for Paul Mariani. So if we could just bow our heads, I'll say a prayer, and then we'll move on with the program. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. May today there be peace within. May you trust God that you are exactly where you're meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content knowing you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, to dance, to praise, and to love. It is there for each and every one of us. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So <clears throat> this is a special luncheon um, because it launches the Church in the 21st Century Center's 20th anniversary. And for those of you um, that have been around Boston College, it's hard to believe, right, that the Church in the 21st Century Center uh, started back in 2002. And of course, many of you know um, that it was born out of the sexual abuse crisis in Boston. And Father Leahy came forward and said, I want to take all the major riches of this Jesuit Catholic University and put them at the feet of the church to mine the gap. So our mission is going to be about renewal and about coming up with new ways to gather people together and to move our church forward. Um, one of our wonderful friends along the way during our 20 years has been Paul Mariani. He's done several, countless actually, um, C21 events over the years, even in the early days and then throughout. And he, for me, defines the riches of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, and you'll, most of you realize that, but those of you that don't know Paul and just came to this luncheon, um, you're in for quite a magnificent surprise. I'm not big on intros, um, but Paul's story is just extraordinary. So if you'll forgive me, this intro is a little bit longer, but worthy of this man. Um, so here we go, Paul. <laughs> Paul Mariani is the oldest of seven children, born to a working class family in New York City. He was raised in Long Island and earned his BA in English language and literature from Manhattan College. He went on to achieve his master's at Colgate University and his PhD from the City University of New York. After spending 32 years as Distinguished University Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst from 1968 to 2000, Paul joined the English Department at Boston College, in which he currently serves as University Professor of English Emeritus. He also served as Poetry Editor of America Magazine from 2000 to 2006. Paul, I think Father Leahy came to UMass to try to get you. That's the story I heard. Um, Mariani is our Paul, I'd like to say, is the author of 20 books. I'm not going to list them all because we'd be here all day, um, including nine volumes of poetry, over 250 essays, introductions, and reviews. In his two most recent books that we'll talk about today, Ordinary Time and All That Will Be New. Paul is also known for his biographies on poets, including Gerard Manley Hopkins, William Carlos Williams, Wallace Stevens, John Berryman, and Robert Lowell. His biography of Hart Crane, entitled Crane's Poem, The Broken Tower, was adapted into a feature-length film. There is nothing this man can't do. In 2009, Mariani received the John Carty Award for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry, and in 2019, the inaugural Flannery O'Connor Lifetime Achievement Award. So I thought it would be so fitting to have Paul here today to tell you about his new books, 
um, and get the story behind the story of the poems. He's gonna read several poems to you and just be with us. Um, and most importantly, I thought we would open it up to your questions. So along the way, be thinking um, about what you'd like to ask Paul, because he's such an inspiration and he's taught me so much about my Catholic faith um, and about the life and, and work um, here at Boston College. So with that, Paul, let's get going. We welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. And Mrs. Mariani is with us as well. So good, so very good to be back on this campus again. Oh boy, it's so good. Uh, I've missed it, I've missed my students. Uh, I, I taught here for 16 years from 2000 to 2016. I had the greatest, greatest students and I just wish I could continue to teach, actually uh, I do try to teach in terms of uh, people e emailing me with their poems and that kind of thing, and I go over them and work with them that way. So that, that is one way of continuing the work. In fact, I have a group out there in, in Montague called the Kitchenettes, okay? Uh, three women, local women, who come over once a month, and we go over their poems, okay? And they're doing very, very well. They're really doing well. Oh, I... I, I, I remember how I, I made a retreat with the Jesuits down here in, in 1999. Um, and at the retreat with my director, the Jesuit director, um, I remember him uh, telling him, I said, you know, uh, when you ask me to think about, you know, wh wh where I should be going now that I'm approaching 60, and I said, as I walked up the stairs last night, I could swear I could hear a voice saying, go to BC, go to BC. And first I thought it meant British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said, Look, Boston College, I, I really, I don't know anybody at Boston College. He said, well, look, finish the retreat, and then, you know, but if the thought keeps coming back, if it keeps coming back to you, then you might want to reach out to somebody at Boston College, which is what uh, I did three weeks later when it kept haunting me, go to BC, go to BC. I didn't know anybody, so I wrote directly to Father Leahy, and it worked out. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. And uh, I had a great colleagues in the uh, English department, and as I say, Extraordinary students, really. Uh, so, you know, uh, one of the things from the time I was a teenager was writing poems, trying to write poems. I even won $10 once <laughs> when I was uh, 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 studying for the priesthood uh, with a Marianist order because I had gone to Chaminade in Long Island. And uh, it was a sonnet, it was a religious sonnet, obviously. And then I realized I wanted to be a teacher. I studied a lot of, you know, the great books, but what I wanted was poetry, I think. It, you know, that became clearer and clearer to me. And so I began by researching the lives of poets, becoming a biographer. Spent 10 years in my first biography huge book, about 850 pages on the life of William Carlos Williams. That's where it started. Why? Well, because he wrote a, an epic called Patterson, and my mother's family was from Patterson, New Jersey. So that was the, uh, that was the connection. I remember my mom there is, you know, when I was a little boy, we walk over to the Great Falls and look down. And so it went on. And then I remember I had a uh, 
uh, and it, uh, Alan Mandelbaum was my, was my director and my mentor. And uh, he brought over an Italian poet, Giovanni Giudici. And G G Giovanni stayed with us and I showed him a few of my poems and he said, Paolo, it is time for you to stop being an altar boy and to become a priest and ascend the altar of poetry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I began to write, you know, more poetry. And so it's gone, gone on and on. Uh, uh, Ordinary Time came out a couple of years ago. The title you'll, you'll catch, Ordinary Time, in terms of the church year, Ordinary Time. And a lot of these poems are about my family. They're about my grandchildren. I wanted to write poems for each of my five grandchildren, get them in there. I wanted to write about my, my dear wife, Eileen. Um, wanted to talk about getting old, um, et cetera. And then last year when the COVID was really hitting, January of last year, uh, 2021, I promised myself I'd write one line of poetry a day, one line, that's it. If I did that, I could move on to other things. Well. What happened was the one line became two, became four, became eight, et cetera, okay? And I found myself meditating a great deal on images, on paintings, looking at them to see what those paintings could tell me as if they could somehow speak to me. So that's what uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about today is, is meditating on these paintings in terms of, when I would write the poems, I would always pray first. I would always say, Lord, you know, this is something I've been doing since I was a teenager. Help me, you know, just focus me so that I can, I can, honor, I can honor you. And so, oh, so that's what uh, I've, been, I've been trying to do in these poems. So, I'd like to read the first one, um, which is, um, it doesn't look like a religious poem, but uh, a, a good friend of mine who is a, uh, an Episcopal minister said, Paul, prologue, uh, prologue Northeaster at Pr Prout's Neck by Winslow Homer, he said, you caught it, you caught the baptism, you caught what it means to have that cold water hit you in the face, and a new realization, waking up to something, okay, as time goes on. So that's what I was uh, after, uh, to somehow get those primordial forces and the God that is behind those primordial forces uh, into the poem. So here we go, prologue. The primordial tensions of those natural forces. Watch as the massive waves surge forward, then back out into the vast Atlantic, as if sucked into some blue black vortex, even as another wave, and then another, comes crashing in to smash against the jagged granite shore. The silver glitter spume explodes just feet away, as old and now instant as, as that whirlwind confronting Job. How is it Homer caught the drama in his Northeaster, just yards from that rustic cabin there on Prout's Neck along the coast of Maine back then? And now the painting glowers in the cloister-like environs of the New York Met, replete with a sleepy guard. Homer caught it all. School kids playing crack the whip in those fields outside some one-room schoolhouse. Those three Confederate prisoners surrendering at Petersburg to be interrogated by a Union officer one, a hillbilly kid, another an old man lost, 
and that young rebel officer, hand on hip, his steady, sullen staring in defiance even now. Then later, those southern whites and blacks in those unforgiving years of reconstruction, that white mistress standing awkwardly by the door, not knowing what to say to her former slaves, nor they to her. Or those English working classes, the Bermuda natives among the sands and palmettos, the dangers of the sea, the drifting boat with a lone black man as sharks circle him with a typhoon rising in the distance. And in time, even people disappear from his canvases. And it's the sea alone the painter dwells on as that creation's start. As with the poet who must face the blank canvas of the page and stare and stare and stare again. And then if he is blessed or cursed, a word at last comes uttering forth and then another and another and then a line, a force, a tension felt between a gray, a cobalt blue, a green, a dash of red, an orange dot, and a smear of white to say, this is a painting. And then another swirl of white as three waves spill. And then that giant wave exploding again, 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 as the thing itself, the real, comes crashing finally down on you. So that was the opening. That was the opening, that sense of a baptism, of looking hard, what is the real? What is the real for us? And then what the poems try to do is to take a look at various aspects of that reality in the faces of the poor, the, uh, those that are marginalized, um, as in, for example, the poem, Poor Favette. Wrong book, let me try again. <laughs> Jules Bastien Lepage, Poor Favet. Eighteen eighty one. Is that picture available? Is it? Yeah. Oh boy, this one caught me. This little girl out in the field with thistles and a cow munching on whatever's left over. The gray sky, the barren bush, trees. Late winter, and the little girl stares off, her gaze reaching down into your soul. She's wrapped herself in a makeshift shawl of brown cloth to ward off the cold this very morning as she stands there in some wintry field out in Danvier, minding the family cow as it feeds on straw and thistle. There are some glorious pictures, D.H. Lawrence wrote a friend, after viewing the canvas at a winter exhibition some 30 years after Bastien Lepage painted the scene, the artist himself long since gone. But nothing caught his eye like this scene as he watched the lovely woman in her smart 
dark velvet suit and hat, its feathers flowing down over her shoulders. A woman so unlike that poor Favet. Too sad, the woman whispered, as she confided to the man beside her there. But then, that is what the country does to one. And now, the moment over, the two moved on to yet another landscape, and then another. And here's the thing. It's the gaze of that little girl, isn't it, that embeds itself upon your heart before you too find yourself likewise turning away. How many times have you been stopped when you least expected by someone asking you to look at them and listen? Like the daughter of an old friend, himself long gone, catching you in the frozen parking lot of the old brick church just after mass this morning, when all you wanted was to climb inside your car for warmth, her face and yours masked by this pandemic, though her teary eyes spoke volumes as she began to speak of the deep rifts between her brother and herself. And what was there for you to do but listen in that freezing morning? Pain is pain. Pain is personal. Still, you've learned to listen, which somehow seems to help. To help the other as it helps your sorry self just to know you care. Something that seems to repeat itself more and more now, giving back something of yourself. Like that bread just offered you, which you consumed before you left the parking, parking lot to head back home for coffee, eggs, and toast. Which is more than what poor Favette will feast on when she returns this evening back home, cold and weary to sup on her daily bread, if that, both those gazes etch now on your heart. just to reach out, just to listen, just to listen to what the other person has to say. I'm gonna change the uh, tone a little bit here, a little bit lighter this one. This one is called The Poet as 80-year-old sous chef. What better way to spend my time now than to play the sous chef as my dear wife prepares this very day yet another of our heavenly meals? Cinnamon yellow squash soup with hints of fresh mint, a melting mellow eggplant parmesan, chicken a la francaise, crumb apple pie, Ah, lucky me to have been chosen to dice the scallions and onions, peel the potatoes, gather from a little garden parsley, basil, and some thyme, then back inside to uncork a bottle of three-star wine. Oh, to put aside the books that keep staring up at me, clamoring to be read, a fresh translation of the Odyssey, Dante's Convivio, Flannery, Chesterton and Joyce, as well as a dozen poets, each with his or her distinctive voice, but who too often now 
remain unsung. And that pile of books, each clamoring to be blurbed and praised, as by the looks of it they no doubt deserve. But oh, that freedom just to be. But be what? And now it's half past five, and she's calling up to me. Time, dear, she sings, to be the sous chef you were called to be. <laughs> yes. Oh, cut it. Okay. This next, uh, this next poem is called The Wheel, The Wheel. And it's, um, it's a true story and I still can't explain it. That's the whole point. What happened to me that day when I was a teenager uh, driving the old, the old 47, the old 47 Pontiac back in uh, Le Levittown. The Wheel, The Wheel. Sixteen and a half, with a brand new driver's license in my wallet. Driving my father's 47, two-toned old clunky Pontiac. I turned left off Hempstead Turnpike. When a car, what make or color I can't recall, appears shark-like off to my right and it's there in front of me and I'm twisting the steering wheel first left then right then Somehow, in this I swear to, friend, the wheel itself takes over, <clears throat> spinning this way, then that. The danger's past, and the car disappears into the past, <clears throat> and I breathe again. Now, this was 65 years ago, mind you, and still I can't explain what happened. Do you believe in guardian angels? Well, since that day, I confess I do. I don't know if they have wings or not, but they sure have strength, like the one who wrestled Jacob that dark night. And they're there all right. The wheel, the wheel, that force behind those starry wheels that spin about the earth, heaven wheels, above you, revealing your great glories, Dante sang. And still your eyes stay focused on the ground. But trapped behind that wheel, something deigned to save the car and me. And I alone am left to tell the story. This is disguised gin that I'll be. Uh, <laughs> mm. Very good. So there are two more poems I'd like to read, and then we'll open it to uh, a discussion, okay? Uh, and they're both uh, from Caravaggio, and you've got images of those as well. The Calling of St. Matthew, and then two versions of the Supper at Emmaus that Caravaggio did, one in 1601 and then the one in 1606. And you can see how uh, in those two images how Jesus is portrayed. He's a young man in the 1601. In the 1606, he looks more like his own age, and he looks... He, to tell you that he looks a little tired. You know, he's been through a lot. There's a quietness about it. But of course, then you've got the two disciples who are absolutely stunned by what is going on right in front of them in the communion, in the sacrifice of the bread and wine. The others don't get it. The innkeeper doesn't get it. The old woman there 
is too tired to get it, but the others get it. So the first one is um, a calling of, the calling of St. Matthew. Caravaggio, the calling of St. Matthew, 1599-1600. Like God the Father in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, who searches Adam's face, stretching his right arm out to touch and awaken him to life, so here, in Caravaggio's painting above the altar of King Louis, there in Rome, it is Jesus this time, round, reaching out his arm toward the tax collector, Matthew, who in turn points his own hand toward himself, stunned at being singled out like this. In the meantime, Two young tax collectors, startled as if they too have been uncovered, look up for an instant, while another two, one who's clearly been in the money laundering business a long time now, keep their heads down, preoccupied with a pile of silver coins that glitter there on the coarse grain table, half hidden in the shadows. The preternatural light, let's call it that, that struggles with the dark seems to catch the drama of it all. A gift offered in that instant that could satisfy a hungry heart. And look, there's Christ's hand held out again 10 years on, Caravaggio pointing out the truth again as the dead man Lazarus is jolted back once more into, his, into the light, his arms flailing as life begins to flow back into his limbs. He was a brawler, no doubt, this Caravaggio. And just how many he maimed or killed or conned must be left for scholars to figure out. But a many few at least. First, he fled Milan, then Rome, then in time it was on to Naples, then on again this time to seek protection from those knights in Malta. Then finally, it was down to Sicily before he headed back to Rome, sailing up the coast, hoping once again to be pardoned, this time by no less than the Pope himself, in exchange, of course, for those final priceless paintings only Caravaggio himself could execute. Among the three, there's one of St. Ursula. At the very instant, the mad Hun's arrow penetrates her breast. As now, she gazes down at what's just happened, her eyes those of a contemplative, accepting of the end she's reached, while the artist, who surely knew his share of sharks and gangsters, reveals himself as one more member of the gang, staring down now in disbelief at what his brushstrokes have revealed about himself, even as the scene screams before his eyes. Brother, sister, it was much like one of us, I fear. Someone, no doubt, who felt unworthy to be singled out, yet someone who could paint far better than his rivals, as well he knew himself. Someone, too, who saw deeper than most of us, as his paintings likewise clearly show. Yet there was a price upon his head for sure. But how much? Only God can know. Redemption? Hope so. 
And then the final poem is uh, Supper at Emmaus. Post-resurrection, the two disciples walking down towards the road uh, to Emmaus on that first day of the resurrection, that Sunday, inviting Christ in, the stranger. And then he breaks the bread. And in the breaking of the bread, as Luke says, they realize who this is, who, who, who is broken for them. And there's that hand again, reaching out this time to bless the bread that's been set before him on the table. It's a small loaf, really, just a roll, and it's been broken, much as his body was three days before. To his left, there's a pewter pitcher with black lines striped across it and a glass half hidden, filled with blood red wine. He must be real, this Nazarene, because you can see his shadow on the worn leather jacket the old innkeeper's wearing, who's gazing down at this stranger as he wonders what's going on. In the foreground seated are two disciples. One is Cleophas, the other, strangely, looks like Peter, at least from other portraits Caravaggio painted of the man. The same disciple who denied Christ three times out there in the courtyard and who now seems to inch his right hand close and closer to Christ's wrist as if to check if this could really be the man. In the upper right stands an old woman bent and weary from the daily chores she's, been done, she's done so long that nothing seems to faze her anymore. So that as the man breaks bread as an offering of himself, we cannot read what it is she's thinking. And here's the thing. There's another version of this same scene which Caravaggio painted five years earlier. In this one, Christ appears clean-shaven and is so much younger, which may be why the men failed at first to recognize this stranger who had walked beside them. But look at what the painters rendered. There's a glass carafe of wine, a bowl of fruit, and a roasted capon on the table, a Sunday feast for sure. And once again, an innkeeper stands looking down, puzzled as this stranger blesses the bread, then breaks it, even as those two disciples are clearly shaken, perhaps like us as well, by what is really happening here before our eyes. Got those out. And that uh, period of grace when the poems came has, uh, seems to have gone for a while now, but hope, hopefully with time it'll come back. So um, I'd love to turn this out over to anybody who might have uh, questions. I'd like to try to answer them as best I can. So. Can you hear me? Yes. I have one quick question. Just curious. I know as parents we'd never admit that we have a favorite child, but do you have a favorite poem that you've written that just you wrote? Do you have a favorite poem? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Boy, let's see. Um, there's the one 
that, that immediately comes to mind is a poem that I wrote for uh, Frank Serpico is one. Uh, I don't know, does the name Frank Serpico mean anything to anybody here? Uh, for the younger people, it might be harder, but Frank Serpico was the one who blew the whistle on the corrupt police force in New York City uh, back in the year 1966-67. And uh, he, was, he was my student, okay? Uh, when I taught, when I was, was going for my PhD, I was also teaching uh, police officers uh, down on 23rd Street, okay? They were going for a degree in, they had to take courses in criminal justice, but they had to take a course or two in humanities. So here are these police officers that I'm teaching, Plato, Dante, uh, Cervantes, uh, others, okay? It was great. Uh, it was great. And uh, I remember Eileen and I dated uh, with Frank. If, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the movie Serpico uh, uh, with Al Pacino. It's a good movie. It did a good job. Uh, but uh, I remember just one incident where uh, he said to me, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, you're Frank Serpico. You're one of my students in uh, 211. He said, that, leave it at that, okay, leave it at that. <laughs> so we double dated Eileen and I a couple times. He would show me, he'd say, see the third floor there, there's where mobster A, B, and C live, that kind of thing. <laughs> he says, come on over, we'll get some grappa over here in this pizza place. <laughs> so he knew the, you know, he knew the village. Um, but I remember uh, we were going out one night to, uh, I, I would have to teach the same class in the afternoon and then eight hours later, you know, on the next shift for the police, okay? So I'd have to stick around and then teach it again in the evening. Now after the evening class, the uh, police would invite me down to Rooney's Bar on the corner and uh, we'd have a, a drink and uh, there, was, uh, there was just one time when, uh, when Frank uh, came with us and uh, he told a story about that, how he had, uh, what shall I say, too much on, okay. I'm getting the word from my wife, I'm going on too long. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to the next question. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, next question. Anything. There's someone back there. Thank you. Um, so how much of your, so you studied William Carlos Williams. Oh. So this, this I, right now. Um, so with William Carlos Williams, right, images, no ideas, button things. Yep, so uh, no ideas, button things, William Carlos Williams. So uh, how much of your work is inspired versus how much of it it's inspired by some, some physical thing versus inspired by something that you don't quite understand. Some, I think by both. I, I really think uh, that both inspire me. Sometimes uh, it could be just a musical piece chain gang or something like that. I don't know what, it, I don't know what it's going to be, but something. It might be uh, something, opera piece, uh, but I think more uh, paintings uh, are one thing that really moved me. And then just trying to see what's in front of my eyes, to pay attention to this moment and to see if I can get this moment down on the page. I think uh, a lot of my poems are about growing up, you know, in a, in a, in a working class family. What was that, what was that like, you know? Um, my time in the 1960s when I worked, uh, okay, uh, Serpico is one. Uh, yes, uh, I wrote a long poem about 
and, and I did it in Dante's Terzarima form, okay, in which I try to uh, recall meeting, I've done six biographies, and so what I try to do is I go through a kind of purgatory and visit with the shadows of those, of those poets that I wrote about, okay? And I'm led, my Virgil is Alan Mandelbaum, who was my mentor, okay, from a, 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 a rabbinical family. And a wonderful man, wonderful translator of Dante, uh, Homer, uh, Virgil, etc. cetera. And uh, so I try to, you know, come to, you know, after all these years, I, I, I visit them to see if I got anything right in terms of what I said about them. Okay, so that, that's a, a, long, a long poem. Um, sometimes uh, it'll just come in a moment, uh, I may be riding home with my wife, and I, I remember one where we went out, uh, the kids, you know, my, my three sons invited us uh, for Mother's Day, uh, and I wrote a poem about the blessings, just the blessings of family. That's one of the great blessings for me, just to have my family. Honestly, I, 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 that's the most, I think that's the most important thing is. And then of course, friends, my, my wonderful students. Um, it's hard to say, my, my most recent poem, just to give you an example. I'm walking down the street with my Jesuit son. The oldest is a Jesuit who teaches Chinese uh, uh, Chinese uh, history in Santa Clara, okay? And uh, he has this way of looking at something and he'll just stop and just stare at it. And he's taught me to do that as well. So he, we're walking down and he says, Dad, just look at, look at the sun setting now. And then he turns around and he says, now look at the way the sun is reflecting, the shimmering the glistening of the light against the leaves of the yokes and the maples. And just out of that experience, uh, I see it new as if for the first, even though I've lived there for over 50 years, I see it as if for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be one of the things that grace does. It, it never grows old. It's always renewed, 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 yeah. So, okay. And yes, over here, please, sister. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I found, um, and I wondered if you could talk about the fact that you included, I mean, in this book, all that will be new, the social justice issue, creation, the, you know, uh, the uh, connection to art and uh, tragedies. I mean, there's so much in here. Your family, of course, the history of your family. So, uh, you know, was that your intention to give us all of that? There was so much, you know, as I read each poem, I said, oh my God, this is social justice. Oh my God, this is about creation. You know, it was just so wonderful to go through the poems and to find all that in them. Would you like to be my agent? I could pay you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sister. Uh, yeah, I, I really have tried uh, to get it all in there. I think, especially, you know, it's of all those things that you mentioned, I think the social justice issue has, has, has become, in, you know, more prevalent, you know, more to the forefront as time goes, as I understand more about what, what our history has been, you know. Um, yeah, there's uh, just uh, yeah the morning after the assassination of Malcolm X, for example. Okay, I was down in New York in 19, you know, when it happened in 1968. It was the winter. Uh, I think it was 68, maybe 67. I'm, but uh, I had gone into the city to pick up a, 
go up to Columbia where they, they had these books on French literature and French language because I had to take, we had to take you know, various languages. One of the languages we had to take was French, okay? So I took the subway up into Harlem and you know, it, if I had only thought about it, you know, this is the morning after the assassination of Malcolm X and here I am taking a subway up into Harlem a white guy. I mean, it's not a smart. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> it's just not a very smart thing. <laughs> and I remember uh, there was a. Uh, uh, there was an African American, uh, in the in the uh, subway be behind the, uh, the cashiers. You know the check where you get you you get your tokens, and I said, "How do I get over to Columbia from this station?" Because it was I knew it was just like 116th Street, so it was just a matter of going up. He says. Well, what you do is you get back on the train and you go downtown again. And then you take another train and you go up. I said, thanks very much for your advice. I said, but it's much easier for me to just... <laughs> Jesus so I walked out and then I realized the town was absolutely quiet. I mean, they had just lost Malcolm X. You know, and it, it was only later that I understood what the hell was happening, you see? Sorry. And I remember walking right up by Columbia, uh, Columbia Heights, and there were two young, uh, I think they were, they were dressed in black suits, they may have been black Muslims, uh, young men. Uh, and I said, shit, I said, what's gonna happen now? Because I gotta walk right through them. And they looked at me like they were surprised, and then they just winked at each other, and they said, let, let the guy through. <laughs> and then I went right up. But I mean, just things like that, uh, that stick with you, you know, how, how, how much we don't know, you know. So I, I've been trying, uh, I have another poem about uh, Harriet Tubman in there, you know. So you try to do what you can, the little that you can, so. That's, social justice is, is even in the opening poem, uh, when I look at Winslow Homer's work and what, in Reconstruction, you know, that image, for example, where uh, uh, the woman who was, quote, the owner of the slaves comes to visit them and they don't know what to say to each other, obviously, you know, things like that. So there's a lot to learn, yeah. Well, it's already an hour. Um, that said, I invite anyone, if they want to stay and ask Paul some questions after, you're most welcome. Also, we can't get enough of Paul Mariani. So if, in fact, um, you want to join us next Friday, it's October 21st on Zoom at 1 o'clock. We're doing a Faith Feeds. Um, a lot of you are familiar with our program, an opportunity to talk about faith. Um, and we do it every Friday afternoon at 1 on Zoom. We selected Paul's newest book as our book club, and he will be on Zoom next Friday again, sharing his, his gifts and his poems. Um, Paul, we can't thank you enough for the gift that you are. Thank you. And for teaching us so much about life and faith and art and poetry and love. Um, I also want to draw your attention before we leave. There's a couple of things on your table um, that are upcoming C21 events. One is an online workshop um, for ordinary time, Paul, um, on the parables. We're going to go over five. Uh, uh, parables and then also there is um, a wonderful event next Thursday night here at Boston College with Ambassador Hackett um, who's going to share his new book and his his life and, and his good work um, and then also we have a weekly program called Pray It Forward join us on Wednesdays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Zoom for 15 minutes um, and we pray together as a Boston College community. So we invite you to do that. And then um, there's a couple of uh, most recent magazines. And um, follow along with us this fall. We're going to keep, you know, doing more and more events. Um, we're also going to have a really fun um, Saints exhibit that's going to open up on All Saints Day at the O'Neill Library. So we're very excited about that. We'll keep you posted. But um, Paul and Eileen... Thank you again for driving all this way. Um, my, my guess is you're probably going to have a poem by the time you get home. Um, <laughs> but anyway, God bless, and thank you all for coming. Um, because all we want to do is give things away, um, 
the moms on the table, if you know someone that a mom might brighten their day, please take it. Also, we have extra lunches. Do you know someone that might like a lunch or um, you wanna give it to someone, whatever, give it away, okay? So again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Paul.